Inguruan, ba, zuzenean burura datorkigu Index for Inclusion delakoa, ez da? Bueno, ba, Index horren bi aitetako bat gurekin dago gaur. Tony Booth jauna da. DBH-ko irakasle oia, Cambridge-ko unibertsitateko katedra duna, eta han eta hemen ematen dituen e, itzaldietan insistitzen du inklusio prozesu arrakastatxuak izateko, ez dela bakarrik implikatu behar eskuntza sistema, baizik eta gizarte osoa. Ongi etorri beroa, eman dieza jugun Tony Booth jaunari. Welcome to the Basque Country, welcome to the stage. Mr. Booth, well, you um, published your Index for Inclusion in the year 2000. Yes. I'm sure by now uh, you've had enough time to think about the paradoxes and the dilemmas in the inclusion processes, and this is what you want to talk about today. That's, that's true. Thank so you. So I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Ooh. Good morning. It's really good to be here in Bilbao, in, in the Basque country. There's a very bright light at the back. Um, well, I've been thinking about these things for a long time, but I hope uh, when I think about them that I also change my views. And I'm here today to think about these things together. You know how that works? really in a school or in a, a university or in a country. There are lots of people and they all have good ideas. And if the ideas that are put into practice or into policy only come from a few people, then they're diminished. Uh, I thought about this uh, picture of the Guggenheim Museum, and outside there's um, this giant spider made by uh, Louise Bourgeois. And uh, she said it's a representation of her, her mother, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a problem perhaps to think about your mother in that way. Uh, it raises a number of dilemmas about care and uh, maybe both being a carer and a predator. But I thought maybe we should think about this uh, construction of uh, Louise Bourgeois as, uh, as us, as education in the Basque country. And here, whoops. I just go back. Maybe that happens. Oh, there we go. There are our children here. And we have to decide what is the web we will weave across the Basque country, across my country, for, for our children. Will it be a, a, a web of protection? Will it be a web of inclusion? Will it be a web uh, of exclusion. You know, I come from, this is my city, uh, Cambridge. It's a, it, it's a beautiful city. Well, parts of it are beautiful, but that's what we tend to show the tourists. And uh, when we think about the city, we think about this sort of lovely river and the backs of the colleges. But there's another story of Cambridge, as there is of every city. So this is uh, also my city. It's a few steps, really, from my house. It's not far. Maybe every evening, if I walk into the city from my house, which is a 10-minute walk, I will find several people who are uh, living uh, on, on, on the street. And my city is one of the richest cities in, in England and in, in, in the world, really. It's a very wealthy place. And I think, you know, okay, I, I, the index for inclusion is 20 years old. My country is a lot older, and yet we haven't solved the problem of how 
people with, uh, in, in a very wealthy country, how we can still have people who have nothing uh, and, and, and live on the street. These were the questions that I've asked of myself this morning. What is inclusion? What is exclusion? How can we create participative communities in our schools and beyond our schools? And you will know that uh, there's a dilemma around achievement. So I ask the question, how can we create, uh, how can we encourage high achievements? Because in our societies, uh, people think there's only one answer. How can we link schools to inclusive cities? And how can education respond to the most important issues of our times? Because if it doesn't respond to the most important issues of our times, what kind of education is it? And I give the examples of the issue of migration and of climate and environmental breakdown. So what is inclusion? What is exclusion? Of course, you've answered the question partially when you tie the concepts together. And it's remarkable how often people keep those ideas separate, as if inclusion is one thing, but when we think about inclusion, we don't have to think about exclusion. Actually, when we think we have very little expertise in inclusion, maybe we should think of the expertise we have in exclusion and reverse it. I said that we don't do these things on our own. This is uh, a slide I take from <coughs> a... <coughs> <clears throat> a Belgian, <clears throat> my voice, uh, I was shouting uh, a speech in the public square of uh, Cambridge last weekend, and my voice has uh, su suffered a little bit. Um, it's a slide taken from a, a, a Belgian colleague, um, a, a Flemish-speaking part of Belgium, you know, not so well integrated, the Flemish part of Belgium and, um, and the French part, after all these years. Um, and she... I'll just... Uh, delicious, thank you. <coughs> She uh, was thinking about the same process that uh, your minister was talking about earlier, about diversity. And uh, in, in her slide, she represents the, the issue of diversity in this way. To pull diversity from the outside of our thinking from the outside of our education system and, and to recognize that diversity is the system. Diversity is all of us. It's the ways in which we are all different and all similar. <clears throat> I hope uh, that we're at this point where we think Inclusion is about developing the school, the community, the city, our societies for everybody. But we've got used to having words like uh, development, quality, good practice, um, even inclusion that we use without defining them. So the notion of development is not simple. One person's idea of a highly developed school 
is another person's educational nightmare. So in order to understand development, what makes a more developed school, we have to think about it in terms of a shared framework of values. So development is change that arises from a shared framework of values. And so the task of inclusion becomes the task of putting inclusive values into action. And that's the heart uh, of my work as it's developed in the Index for Inclusion. Being clear about the values that you want to put into practice is the most practical step you can take in education. People think of values as some uh, theoretical notion that has no uh, impact. But I think of values as uh, only in evidence when you see them in practice. Values are deep-seated beliefs which operate as a push for action. And in my scheme, these are the headings. Equality, rights, participation, community, respect for diversity, sustainability, nonviolence, <coughs> trust, courage, Honesty, beauty, compassion, love, joy, hope, connectedness, and, and wisdom. And together, these values answer the question, how should we live together? My first fundamental question for education and for understanding uh, inclusion. How should we live together? Sometimes people say, this is a bit of a long list. Couldn't we do with fewer of these headings? Maybe then you take some away. Let's get rid of, uh, of wisdom and connectedness and joy and love. So now we have a, a reduced education. Can we have education without compassion or love or joy or hope or connectedness or wisdom? We have to be prepared in uh, education to allow these difficult concepts like inclusion, to, to be answered in a fairly detailed way. I found uh, an example of people who, who somebody who was questioning um, the development I'd made in, in um, understanding inclusion. So you'll see that uh, the notion of sustainability is there as one of the headings because it seems hard to me to think you could have uh, inclusion without thinking that you have an environment in which children can flourish. How can we have inclusion if we uh, don't have um, environments in which children's lives are sustained? But this is what uh, uh, so someone said, a, a Spanish author, working with an English author. I won't tell you their names. The most recent version of the index contains items that did not seem to be relevant to the Spanish context. And these items were, the school reduces its carbon footprint and use of water. The school contributes to the reduction of waste. Children investigate the importance of water. 
Water, the one most important resource in the whole of, uh, 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 of our planet, which links every single one of us together because like uh, you saw in my picture, where do, where do all our cities grow up? They grow up near water because we are water. <laughs> we need water. It's a, a symbol of, of our inclusion. Children investigate the Earth, the solar system, and the universe. Children study life on Earth. Children investigate sources of energy. And I'll come back to those ideas a little later when I'm talking about the, the in inclusion um, in, in the city. So I, I've set up a framework of inclusive values, but I wanted to say that these values are also always um, on the point of becoming less inclusive and more excluding. So equality in our schools is often replaced by hierarchy, rights by opportunity, participation by consumption, community by belonging to a narrow in-group, respect for diversity by monoculture, sustainability by exploitation, trust by surveillance, honesty by image, courage by compliance, nonviolence by discrimination, Compassion by self-interest. Love by authority. Hope by fatalism. Joy by reward and punishment. Beauty by efficiency. Connectedness by specialization. Dividing everything into such small areas of interest that nothing is connected anymore, and wisdom by power. Do you recognize any of these headings as influencing our education system? So if we want to develop inclusion, we have to connect inclusive values to our actions, and we have to disconnect excluding values from our actions and from the actions of others. And we have to recognize that for many people, the excluding values answer the same, very same question. They answer the question, how should we live together? But we come up with very different answers. I mentioned that uh, the, that one of my headings um, under the framework of excluding values is, is the um, heading of honesty. And in my country, if you go into a school sometimes, they're extremely keen to tell you how wonderful they're, they're, they're doing, and um, they're not so keen to uh, explain to you some of the, the difficulties that they have. And um, it's quite easy to get a fairly false picture of what people are up to in schools. And it's understandable. But I've suggested that the task uh, of, of, in of inclusion, of inclusive development, is to take, you know, a no makeup selfie in which you don't hide anything. So you know how it is, you know, that was me a few years ago. <laughs> and you know, people ask for your picture and you send them the picture from uh, a few years ago and then, uh, of course, uh, things change and even I've changed since then. Actually, I lost a bit of weight, I think.
Sorry? <laughs> I said that it, sometimes people think that this task of developing a framework of values and putting them to action, into action seems theoretical. Well, um, Travis, a young man I met in a school, doesn't think it's theoretical. He thinks it's very practical. He is a, a young eight-year-old boy, and in his school, um, they were going to look at um, my book, The Index for Inclusion, and then have a day uh, thinking about values. And they, the children were making shields um, on which they were putting those things that were most important to them in their lives. And I came into Travis's classroom, and he walked towards me. This is just how he was, with his mouth slightly like this. And he said, are you Tony Booth? I said, yes. I love your book. <laughs> so I said, well, what's the book about? He said, the book, it, it, it's about how you make your school a better place. He said, so, for example, if you have the value of love in your school, then um, if you see someone who hasn't got a friend, well, you make sure that they have someone to be with and they have a friend. And if you come from another country to our school, that's no problem. Because we will all make sure that you know people in our school and you have friends too and you'll settle in and be okay. When I told uh, the teachers about, um, about what Travis had been saying to me, they, they, they were quite surprised. I think they were surprised by the fact that young people could grasp um, the idea of putting values into action um, in a way that some of the um, adults uh, struggled with. Is inclusion, um, is inclusion in opposition to high achievement in school? And that's a dilemma that people have talked about. Maybe there's thousands of articles written about it. Well, I, I, I think I can give the answer, and the answer is no. We can encourage high achievements in many different ways, but we've been stuck in thinking that the only way of encouraging high achievement in our schools is through some competitive system in which school, we compare one school with another, we compare one child with another, we compare one country with another. And maybe most of you are familiar with this program of international student assessment, or PISA. <laughs> Notice that PISA is leaning. <laughs> Will it stay with us forever, or should we give it a push? <laughs> Colleagues in the university I last worked in were, it seemed to me, suffering uh, under the power of competitive views of achievement. This is views from my colleagues, and uh, I'll, I'll read them to you. We live in fear of Ofsted, the Office for Standards in Education. I know there, I think there are some inspectors here, but the inspectors in the Basque country are really lovely <laughs> and uh, always welcome in the schools and uh, in the universities and in the education offices there, you know, it's completely different here. But in my country, teachers can be fearful. Uh, we live in fear of Ofsted, we live in fear of the Higher Education Funding Council. We're going down a traditional conservative route and we're scared of taking risks. It's all about doing and not thinking. 
This is from a senior colleague in a university. Uh, and another colleague, one or two people have to stand up and be counted. And everyone else, and I was thinking, yeah, yeah, you mean me. She meant me, I have, you know, I would always say what I thought needed to be done, and then my colleagues who all said they agreed with me would keep quiet. And everyone else will stand back and watch. There's no culture in this faculty of standing up and speaking your mind. Well, that's what happened uh, with the competitive view of achievement in, um, in my country. Somebody wrote a book uh, about the universities in the UK, and she called it Killing Thinking, the Death of the British University. So this competitive view of achievement, it seemed to me, although people thought it's the only way forward, seems to me to reduce achievement. It may improve results. I set up a website called Everyday Nonsense uh, in Education, in which some of the excesses of, um, I hoped people would send in their stories about the excesses of the um, system of education in my country. So, let me tell you about one story which actually comes from my grandson. He's now 13. When he was 11, he was his first day of secondary school. And uh, the teacher said, um, the first, one of the first things, has anyone got a logo on their shoes? So my, gr my grandson, he's very honest, and he had a raised part of his shoe in which the maker of the shoe could be seen at the back here. So he thought he was getting the answer right. He said, I, I have a logo on my shoe. It's against the school rules. Go to the exclusion room. <laughs> it's w one of the stories. Of course, uh, the school weren't reckoning with my daughter, who's a very, she's a teacher herself and very formidable. And uh, that, my, my grandson, his first day, uh, he, He'd forgotten about this note he was given to bring home until it was near bedtime when he started to cry. And he was terrified that he'd done something wrong. But my, my daughter went to the school and said, look, I buy his shoes. If you have a problem with his shoes, you know, see me. It, it, it was okay. In, that, in his classroom, they got the children to put on their exercise books the, the result they would get in the public examinations at age 16. So the teachers told them the result they would get, like you'll get, uh, they're in, uh, in numbers, one to nine, you'll get an eight, you'll get a four. And they had to write it on the front of their book, age 11, public examination, age 16, and they had to put the result. Well, education is about unpredictability. It's about not knowing the future. It's not about predicting what children will achieve in the future. It's about <clears throat> helping children to surprise themselves and others in what they, what they achieve. Anyway, there was a, the, the, the parents protested, and the school said, okay, we take the, the, the number off the front of the book, but they have to put it on the back of the book. But you know, you have a book. <laughs> it still was making uh, a public statement of what each child was expected to achieve, the constraints on the achievement of, of each child. There's another way, it seems to me, towards high, high achievement. And I think of these inclusion shields, which represent the values of the children as the, and the school as, as, as indicating a, a, a different way. 
And lots of the head teachers in the schools in England, when they work with the Index for Inclusion, have told us that it, it serves like this, as a shield, as a protection from the pressures of you know, our inspection system, which, of course, as I say, is completely different from the one here, and, and enables them to think about uh, development for themselves. How can we create participative communities? I've had a lot of discussions with people in Spain about the extent to which teachers in a school see themselves as, as a community. And I can see that in some countries it's harder than in others. I think perhaps we have a, a, a stronger, maybe a stronger tradition of... Uh, the notion that there is a community of people in a school because of the ways in which um, teachers are employed locally. Whereas I think still, is it the case in Spain that people are employed by the center and assigned to a school, which then is not such a strong point of identification. But if we're developing inclusion, we have to develop uh, communities of teachers and who, who then create collaborative communities of children and reach out to parents. One of the schools that has used um, the index quite extensively is, is a school called Dornay in, in the area of Surrey in England. And one of the parents she saw um, was talking to the head teacher about the index and said, I'd really be interested in, in working with that book, and went home, read the book, and, and asked if she could set up uh, coffee mornings with other parents where they took some questions. You know, the index has 2,000 questions. Well, she took two or three or four questions, which became the basis of discussion um, in, in the coffee morning. It's, uh, she's Carly. I'm taking a lead on this now. That's the thing about the index. It's so di diverse, you can find lots of different answers. It's brilliant. Well, that's very nice of her to say that, that, that about, the, um, about the index, but it did work really well um, in this school. This is a picture of the staff room wall. It's not very tidy, but what it shows is a group of parents coming together in the staff room to look at issues that they had decided on together and set out ideas about what aspects of, for example, the curriculum they thought worked well, what they wanted to change, and what needed some push and development. And this was parents' work. And then teachers came into the staff room and looked at what the parents had done, and the head teacher invited them to put their little um, additions, their post-it um, papers on, 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 on this work. This is a school which had gone a long way in... Uh, creating a, a collaborating community of parents and teachers uh, and children. In another school, um, this is a, I give an example of the building of uh, a community of children. In this school, whenever you went into a, a classroom, two children would get up from their seats and come over to you, and they would say, we are the classroom ambassadors. In our, cla in our classroom today, uh, we are working on this, this, and this, and then you could ask them some questions. So they not only didn't mind the inspector coming into the, the classroom or the visitor coming into the classroom, but it was an educational opportunity for this rotating group of classroom ambassadors to tell visitors about their school. 
And all the classroom ambassadors were gathered together at the end of the day, and we talked about the values in the school. And um, the head teacher was sort of leading the discussion, and she asked them, what is your favorite value? Well, in the school, the values that they picked out as their school values were not exactly the same as the values in the index. You know, schools tend to think sometimes of values as ways of getting the children to behave. Well, values in a school are ways of getting everybody <laughs> to behave. They're a way of structuring the interaction uh, of everybody. So the children would say, oh, I like the value of persistence uh, because if I persist in my work, then I get good, good marks and so on. Anyway, the conversation changed when one of the children answering the questions of the head teacher turned to us and said, and what are your favorite values? <laughs> now, in some schools, uh, that would be an upsetting remark. And you would think, well, what a naughty child to think they could ask the head teacher and, and visitors about their values. But the head teacher straight away started talking about what her favorite value was, and um, it eventually got to me. And one person had said, My, my um, favorite value is respect. And then I I'd added the notion of diversity. So I said, My favorite value is respect for diversity. And this started a discussion. I said, I explained what diversity was, that it's the way in which we're all different and all similar. It's difference within common humanity. So I asked uh, the children, well, where, where do you live? And um, they said, well, in a house. I said, well, where's the house? It's on a street. And, and the street, and then eventually we got, well, it's on the planet. <laughs> it's something we have in common. We have a common home. And Peter said, yes, yes. He was about nine years old. It's like we're all on a boat. And if someone sets fire to that boat, we'll all be hurt. So we have to respect the world. And another child said, it's like we're all on an adventure to find out what we're going to be as adults. I want to be a footballer. Other people want to do different things. And then a little girl who'd been really quiet, she was thinking about this, about the purpose of schooling. A little nine-year-old philosopher and she said I know the answer it's to be who you really are a way of thinking about education which is profound and a million miles away from the competitive notion that we just school is about just boosting um, results. How can we link inclusive schools to inclusive cities and societies? Well, I was having a, a look at what was happening in the Basque region, and I can see that um, there's quite a, a bit of progress has been made around issues of gender e equality. Uh, based on the 2005 regional law. And there's an effort to think about integrating gender equality into ideas of sustainable development for the city. For example, through consultation on public transport and, and support for carers of the young and the elderly who, who are usually women. Well... Oh, my picture's gone off there, but it doesn't matter. Oh, it's back. 
Um, anyway, I was having a chat with Virginie. Where is she? Virginia. Oh, hi. Oh, yeah. And Virginia was tell, telling me about that, of course, it's um, International Women's Day on Friday, and on Friday, um, women are being called on to uh, have a strike, a, a carer's strike. It's uh, a variant on the Greek myth of uh, Lysistrata, but I'm sure it'll be equally um, effective. And that's because in the Basque country, like in my country, like everywhere, uh, equality for women hasn't gone nearly far enough. But we have to make sure that in our education system, it's pushing in the right direction so that um, equality issues are addressed and children are well prepared to come out when they, when they leave school. If it's still necessary to have a strike on International Women's Day, they know how to uh, uh, in engage publicly and actively. Here's uh, Bilbao, an aerial view. And I, you'll know, some of you, that I've been thinking in, in the Index for Inclusion of, well, what would it really mean if you put inclusive values into action in designing the curriculum? And, of course, a curriculum in school, it's not about schools. It's about how we think about knowledge. So this is the structure of how I think about the knowledge we need for an inclusive and sustainable city, which is the same knowledge that we need for an inclusive and sustainable school. And these are my subjects. Food, water, clothing and body decoration, I mean, clothing is body decoration as well as clothing. Housing and building. Mobility, trade and transport. So, mobility, trade and transport, it's about how and why people move around their locality and the world. It's a basic human activity and should be a basic human right. It should be recognized as a basic human right. Mobility, trade and transport, health and relationships, communication and communication technology, literature, arts and music, the earth, the solar system and the universe, life on earth, energy sources, work and activity, and ethics, power, and government. <coughs> and when you put these ideas on, on, on a map of the city, you think, well, th of course those are the things that we should know and learn about, because it's about how a city runs. And the oddity is that the school curriculum looks rather different. And I'd like people to take seriously the idea that in the 21st century, we need to think about this knowledge, in a, in, in the, the knowledge we need, in a different kind of way. Because it answers the second of my two big inclusion questions. Remember the first one? How should we live together? And the second, what do we need to know to live together? together well. I've been interested to discover that other people in other areas of work besides education are thinking in a similar way. So there's an economist called Kate Raworth who's come up with this, the idea, well, what she says is that Economics has the wrong foundation. The foundation has, of economics has to be ethics, just like the foundation of education 
has to be ethics. It has to answer big ethical questions. So economics has to answer the big ethical question. How can people, how can we create finan financial systems which enable people to live together well in such a way that human needs are met and we don't destroy the planet. That seems a sensible way of starting economics. And she's come up with this picture which she calls the donut. You know what a donut is? It's a, it's a, a round cake with a hole in the middle. It's not very good for you, but I think this view of economics is very good for you. So in the, in the ring, you have this safe space for humanity. And beyond the ring, you have the breaching of ecolo ecological limits, like climate change, or the acidification of the seas, or chemical pollution, or loss of fresh water, or changing land away from, um, to such an extent, away from forests that actually it, it, it creates um, climate uh, uh, problems, the loss of biodiversity, air pollution, and so on. So in our, in, 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 in our system, there is a way of linking um, what needs to be done in education and inclusion with what, how, how we think about inclusion in other areas. How can education respond to the important issues of our time? I had a little to say, I think, about migration in relation to the knowledge that's needed in schools. If we ask the question centrally in the curriculum in schools, how and why do people move around their locality and the world? People will grow up with a better understanding of why some people choose to cross the modern creation of national borders. They will understand that with the loss of land use, with increasing climate change or climate breakdown, whenever there are wars, people are going to move around a lot more than they do at the moment. And they'll be prepared for it and they'll understand it. We need to know within education that there is a climate and biodiversity emergency. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction of animals in, 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 in the history of the world. And it may be, if we don't do something about it, it may be the worst. It's, this mass extinction is not produced by an ice age, it's produced by the action of, of, of people. Since 1970, 60% of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles and amphibians have disappeared. A scientist visiting Guatemala with a 35-year gap found that in the rainforest there, 98% of insects had gone within 35 years. The International P P Panel on Climate Change said last year that we had 12 years, it's now 11 years, to achieve massive decarbonization to keep temperature rises to less than 1.5 degrees, above which 
the chances are unstoppable, catastrophic climate breakdown will happen. And at present, even with the agreements in, that, that, were, that were sorted out in Paris, the world is on track for more than three degrees rise. So we need dramatic change. So forgive me for talking about it, but then, you know, this is an edu education meeting. The majority of European firms, companies, have no carbon reduction targets. Last week in the UK, and I know the weather's been unusual here too, we had the warmest winter day ever. And of course, people say, you know, but of course there's climate variation, isn't there? You know, sometimes it's a bit hotter, sometimes it's a bit colder. But if you've got any math mathematical knowledge, you know the detail, the, the truth is in the trend. <clears throat> the last five years have all been the hottest years on record. We had fires breaking out um, across the north of England a week ago because of the lack of rainfall and the grass was so dry that just with an, a fairly ordinary summer temperature, we, we, had, we had fires. Which makes me, I, I love the analogy in the poem earlier, which is, you know, we have to each light a fire for change and bring our fires together. Um, to uh, make a, a huge movement for change, but maybe fire will have to drop that as, a, as, 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 as the um, metaphor for our uh, determination to act. The same way of thinking that brought us the competitive pressures in education. There is only one way. There is only one way of doing things. Is opposed to this different way of thinking about, um, about uh, the climate. The difference being, we, we, we've got to do something. We can't just sit around. This is a picture of a Cambridge clock. Um, it's uh, electronic, but it, it's called a, a chronophage because it has this animal at the top, which as the clock goes round, it seems to be eating time. Well, it's a kind of reminder that, well, it's a reminder of mortality, you know, and, uh, but it's also when it comes to issues like uh, climate breakdown, it's a reminder that we don't have very long and we'd better get moving because time is being consumed. Well, people are getting moving. <laughs> this is, uh, well, was it a couple of months ago, we closed five bridges in London just to say, look, uh, things had better change, otherwise we, 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 perhaps we need to make them change. Have you met, uh, have you, any of you seen um, uh, Greta Thunberg, a young Swedish girl, age 15? She just decided, well, you know, nobody's doing anything. How can it be? This is the most important issue facing humanity and nobody's talking about it in my school. So she thought, I'll, I'll go on strike. This is six months ago. So every Friday, she, well, she sits in front of Parliament uh, with her, her, her notice, school strike for climate, and uh, this has become uh, becoming a, now a global movement. 400 children in Cambridge, um, a couple of weeks ago, came out on strike, and then there's another strike 
on March the 15th, which is a, gl a global strike. This is a cartoon that uh, arose because some people don't like the striking, which they think, so the, this is a, a teacher saying, if you skip school on Friday, I'm giving you a detention. I'm keeping you behind. And the, the world is saying, if you don't skip school on Friday, I'm giving you famine, drought, fire, floods, and war. And the child saying, I'll stick with the planet. See you on Monday. Of course, our prime minister said to the children, you're, you're missing valuable lessons. This is in really a bad thing to do. And the children are thinking, we're having va valuable lessons. You know, a classroom is not bounded by four walls. A classroom is the planet. A classroom is the universe. Oh, these are two uh, lovely young um, girls from, uh, actually they're from my grandchildren's school, and, and they were now leading, taking the, 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 um, taking the lead from Greta and uh, coming out and, and being part of the, the leadership themselves of, of the movement in, in my city in Cambridge. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this is Brussels, 150,000 children came out on, on strike in Brussels. And I like that sign. This was actually in Brussels, and it's, well, it's an English play on words, but make the world Greta, Greta Thunberg, make the world like Greta again. And, and it's a little hit at uh, Donald Trump, which is quite a pleasant activity because he has this phrase, I'm going to make America great again, he thinks. So make the world Greta again because there, there are alternatives. Another world is, is, is possible. And teachers themselves have come out in support. And they're saying the same things as the children. We need to talk about the truth. If we have 11 years, you know, think about it. Compulsory years of schooling, five. Start at five in my country and finish at 16. 11 years. So a child who goes into a school now, age five, is part of this process that we have, the time we have to actually intervene in um, climate breakdown, <clears throat> to uh, make dramatic, dramatic changes. And they are, they do have to be dramatic. Life over the next 11 years should not be as it is today. So, education, a symbol of education. The spider, with its children, its eggs underneath that it has to care for. Well, you have the choices about the kind of education we will create you will create in the Basque country, you will create in this city, that will be created in the cities uh, across the world. Will we create this network, this web, which will help our children to live together well, which will teach them all those things that they need to know in order to live together well? Or we will say, no, nah, all that's too difficult. We'll carry on as we are. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much.